In 1908, three-year-old Puyi is living a satisfactory life with his wealthy family, until one day, a message changes everything. By command of the current empress, Puyi's father is ordered to bring him to the Forbidden City, where the Chinese emperors reside. Puyi's mother seems to know something is wrong. She simply hands her son to his nurse, Ar Mo, asking her to take care of him as her own. Upon reaching the Forbidden City, Puyi and his father are presented before the Empress, who is on the verge of death. She declares the boy to be the successor and the new lord of 10,000 years. She passes away right after, and a black ball is put into her mouth, sealing her words as the absolute order. Little Puyi asks his father when they are returning home, but the man silently bows before his son. He's gonna have to buy him so many toys now. In the next scene, Puyi is crowned as the emperor. It is a crucial ceremony for the nation, but Puyi, being just a kid, jumps on the throne. Even the highest ranking guards aren't allowed to talk back to him, so he gets away with running around the ceremonial hall. Outside, thousands of officials and servants are repeatedly bowing down to the new emperor. He stands in front of them, unable to comprehend his power at such a young age. Then, the kid is taken to the bath, where several officials try to convince him to get into the tub. The kid is entertained by dancing guards while the others bathe him. There is a group of doctors hired just to check his stool and ensure he is eating enough. Puyi's nurse, Armo, brings him to his chamber and sends him to sleep, while telling him the story of how she was appointed. Three years ago, Puyi's family was hiring nurses based on their breast milk. Armo is proven to have the best breast milk among the participants, since she had just given birth to a child. After being selected, she had to give up her child forever to take care of Puyi and make a better life for herself. The scene cuts to 42 years in the future on the Chinese-Russian border. A train carrying war criminals comes to a halt, and many prisoners are hustled into the station. Then, four prisoners suddenly get up and bow down in front of another criminal. They treat him as God, but the man seems uncomfortable receiving their praise. When the criminals are taken away, he goes to the bathroom and commits the unthinkable. Soon, the governor comes looking for the man and starts banging on the door upon getting no reply. As the man watches the sink fill with his blood, it is then revealed that he is none other than the last emperor of China, Puyi. The attempt fails when the governor finds Puyi and saves his life. After that, all war criminals are brought to a public security detention center in Fushun. While being assigned to rooms, Puyi meets his blood brother, Pu Chie. The scene then changes back to 1914. It has been almost seven years since Puyi's crowning, and his family has come to meet him for the first time. The parents leave shortly, but not before leaving their younger son, Pu Chie, with Puyi. Initially, Puchier takes time to adjust to the royal environment. Puyi helps him by boasting about how other people get punished for his mistakes, and how he is allowed to do anything he pleases. This is proven when he breastfeeds off Armo at the age of 10, and no one bats an eye. Just because you can get away with a thing, doesn't mean you should do it. Later, the brothers get into an argument, when Puyi degrades Puchier for wearing yellow, which is a color only the emperor can wear inside the palace. In retaliation, Puchier reveals that he is not the emperor anymore. Puyi tries to discredit him, and asks the guard to drink green ink. When the guard does as told, he thinks his point is proven, but Puchier remains adamant in his claims. He leads Puyi to the top of a newly constructed wall, built to divide the northern residential section from the rest of the Forbidden City. They see a man riding in a car below, with several guards around him, like he is the emperor. Puyi is shaken at the threat being made to his throne. He asks the High Tutor if he is still Emperor, and is told that he will always be the Emperor inside the Forbidden City, but not outside, because China is now a republic, and the legitimate ruler is the President. Another shock hits Puyi when he discovers his dear Armo has been sent away, because he doesn't need a nurse anymore. We see the guards forcefully carrying her out of the palace, refusing to let her meet Puyi to say the last goodbye. The scene cuts to 1950 again. Pu Yi and Pu Chie are imprisoned as war criminals in the same cell. The governor berates all the prisoners for betraying their country in the time of war, ordering them to write down every mistake they have made and crimes they have committed in life. Back in 1919, a tutor named Johnston is assigned to educate 15-year-old Pu Yi. He discovers that Pu Yi is a spoiled, entitled kid who doesn't know the value of hard work. With time, he wins the kid's trust by providing him news from the outside that he isn't allowed to be exposed to. He even gifts Puyi a pair of sunglasses and fights the superior Lord Chamberlain to let the kid wear them. 
Three years pass, and in 1922, Puyi is asked to marry Wan Jung, a princess who matches his standard. When Puyi retaliates that he wants to marry someone of his choice, he is given the freedom to choose his second wife. I'll take it, says Puyi. After the first wedding ceremony, he gets to see Wan's face and is mesmerized by her beauty. She covers his face with kisses while the servants, who are also in the room, take their clothes off. However, Wan stops them midway, and they ultimately decide to sleep without making love. Again, back to the future, Puyi is taken to a room and asked to reveal why he thinks he's in prison as a criminal. His first response implies that he is an innocent man who was pulled into life as an emperor and has no part in China's recent history. The interrogator angrily refuses to take the answer, so the former emperor starts telling him what happened in 1923. By now, he is old enough to rule the way he pleases, and not under adults who exploited their power. First, he cuts off the woven ponytail, which, until recently, was considered a crime against the nation. He then demands audits of the expenses done by the Imperial storerooms. That night, the officials burn the audits to keep their corruption hidden. But the next day, Puyi expels all of them with the help of Republican troops. The interrogator wants to know how Puyi connected with the Japanese. It turns out that in the war, he sided with Japan, which is why he is considered a national criminal. Puyi continues that when he was 19, he and the Imperial family were attacked by the troops of the warlord, Feng. They are given one hour to leave the Forbidden City. Puyi has not been out of the palace since he was three, so the family has absolutely nowhere to go. At such time, Johnston suggests they take asylum in the British Embassy. For the first time in 16 years, Puyi leaves his home, and as they depart, the Republican flag is raised over the Forbidden City. However, unlike what they had decided, the Imperials go to the Japanese Embassy because it is prepared to help. Puyi argues that he did not ask them for support, but aided himself by selling family treasures. Puyi then remembers the time he was in Tientsin. He and his first wife Wan have changed their names to Henry and Elizabeth. They're enjoying themselves at a party, where Puyi's second wife, Siu, is dancing with an American. They get a little too close while talking about Puyi's wives. As they drive to the Japanese legation after the party, Siu declares that she wants a divorce. A shocked Puyi retaliates that no one can divorce him, but Siu leaves shortly after, never to return. Later that night, Puyi's distant cousin Jewel arrives at their residence and meets Elizabeth. While getting high on opium, she reveals that she is a Japanese spy. An innocent Elizabeth trusts her, but still shares her worries about Puyi and his relationship with the Japanese. She is not happy that he sent his brother to a military academy in Tokyo. Later, Puyi is informed about the recent vandalism of their ancestors' tombs by the troops of the Nationalist Party. In the present, Puyi is asked if he joined hands with the Japanese in their transformation of the Chinese city of Manchuria into a Japanese puppet state, Manchukuo. Puyi insists that he has no hand in Manchuria's politics and that he was kidnapped and taken to the city. The governor knows the truth is far from what Puyi is saying. He proves his point by reading a line from Johnston's book, where he has clearly stated the story about being kidnapped is a lie, and that Puyi had a huge role in the transformation of Manchuria. When he still insists otherwise, he is left alone. Then, he recalls what actually happened surrounding his kidnapping. In 1932, the Japanese are using Puyi's hereditary right to rule Manchuria, but he in turn wishes to use them to come back into power. Johnston knows what Puyi is doing is not ethical, but Puyi shows his spoiled and arrogant side once again, claiming that China has turned its back on him. Now, it is his turn to do the same. His wish comes true in 1934, when the Japanese decide to promote Puyi to be Emperor of Manchukuo, now that he has served as head of state for the past two years. He yet again gets to wear the traditional robes of the Qing Dynasty that he took so much pride in. Jewel, who is also at the ceremony, congratulates Elizabeth, telling her that she is an empress again. Then, we are introduced to Emakasu, an order in the Imperial Japanese Army, and Puyi's close work friend. He snaps photos of Elizabeth and Jewel together. He even supervises the filming at the Coronation Bowl that evening. Meanwhile, Puchie is also at the party in a Japanese military uniform with his pregnant wife. As the lively party continues, Elizabeth and Jewel arrive high on opium. Since she is not in her right mind, Elizabeth embarrasses herself by eating daffodils from a flower arrangement. That's not embarrassing. That's funny as hell. 
When Pu Yi confronts her, Elizabeth makes fun of him, claiming that Amakasu is the most powerful man in Manchukuo. They also argue about their sex life, and how he doesn't make love to her anymore. To stop the heated argument, Elizabeth makes a toast to him, and walks out of the party. Back in the prison, Pu Yi continues living like an emperor, bullying his cellmates. To teach him a lesson, the governor puts him in a cell with people who are bound to humble him. In the new cell, Pu Yi is asked to do chores that he has never done in his life. The people who order him are all governed government officials in Manchukuo. Puyi is ordered to pee quietly in a bucket, to refrain from disturbing his cellmates. It is the lowest he has ever been treated. He looks at his former valet for some kind of reassurance, but the man surprises him by asking if he really thinks he is still a servant. Puyi is finally on the receiving side of how he has been treating people until now. Then, in 1935, Puyi returns from a trip to Tokyo, and finds several changes have been made to his government. Waiting for him in the palace are Colonel Yoshioka and Amakasu. The colonel has disarmed the Imperial Guards, and even Puyi's Prime Minister has moved away to a monastery in the hills. It is clear that it is a ruse to get Puyi out of power, but he has no way to retaliate. In the following council meeting, he is asked to sign papers that would appoint Defense Minister Chang as the new Prime Minister. This would directly mean the end of his rule, so he refuses to sign. As a result, all the council members leave the meeting, portraying their dissatisfaction. When alone in the council room, Pu Yi is taken back to the day he found out he was no longer the legitimate emperor. Later that day, Elizabeth announces her pregnancy, but before Puyi can react, they are interrupted by Colonel Yoshioka and Amakasu. They want him to sign the papers he refused to sign in the meeting earlier. Puyi deflects the topic by announcing that he is to have an heir, but is informed by a passive Amakasu that the father of the child is his driver. At last, Puyi has no way out but to appoint Chang as the Prime Minister. In the following scene, we see Puyi shoot his driver dead for seducing his wife. Little PP energy, to be sure. A few months later, Elizabeth gives birth, but the doctor murders the baby. Puyi is told the child was stillborn. Elizabeth runs away from the hospital, never to return, leaving Puyi alone. Then, in 1945, the Japanese emperor surrenders, and the war is over. Jules listens to the surrender broadcast, while Amakasu commits the unthinkable. Elizabeth also comes back from hiding, and is over the moon because of Amakasu's death. She spits in the face of the Japanese soldiers, mocking them. When she comes across her ex-husband, she shakes in shock, and has to be aided by her nurse. Meanwhile, Colonel Yoshioka is trying to run back to Japan, to escape the Russian soldiers. He wants Puyi to join him, but the man delays, trying to get to his wife first. She refuses to come, and eventually Puyi and the colonel are caught. This is how they were imprisoned for five years, before being brought to the prison Puyi is currently in. Back in the present, Puyi is tending to his flower garden in the prison. After years of spending time with the inmates as equals, he has found a passion for gardening. His rivalry with the governor has also died down, and they seem to like each other now. The governor laughs at the fact that all his life, Puyi thought he was better than everyone else, but now he thinks he is the worst of all, which is why he tried to commit the unthinkable. Then comes the year 1959, when Pu Yi is handed a proclamation of release after serving 14 years in prison. He is happily let go of the place to live an entirely new life. The scene cuts to the year 1967. The former emperor now works as a gardener at Beijing Botanical Gardens and is leading a decent life. One afternoon, he visits the Forbidden City and looks at his former throne. As his heart fills with emotions, he steps over the decorative rope beyond which the tourists are not allowed to go. A boy stops him, and Pu Yi replies that he was the emperor of China. When the boy is distracted, Pu Yi disappears and is never found. In the last scene, a tour guide leads tourists into the throne room, telling them about Pu Yi's life story and explaining that he died in 1967. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.